So we've spent a lot of time reviewing general background about computer graphics, and we've also spent a lot of time talking about using Unity as a platform for implementing computer graphics algorithms. And we've talked about shader code in general, but here we'll finally look at some specific examples of working shader code. So we're going to start by looking at some simple shader code that doesn't respond to light. One thing I would like to remind you of is that if you start up a blank 3D project with the traditional built-in pipeline, be sure to go to your player settings and your project settings and make sure that your color space is set to linear. It still defaults to gamma, even in 2020.1 beta, which is bad. You want this to be set to linear. Fortunately, if you start up a universal render pipeline or a high definition render pipeline project, then it defaults to linear as it should be. Okay, let's finally, so many lectures in this class, look at some shader code. The actual HLSL is here between this HLSL program and, and HLSL. In some older shader examples for Unity, you'll probably see CG here instead of HLSL. If you read the current Unity docs, it becomes very confusing because the Unity docs will say that the only difference now between seeing HLSL program and CG program is in the various include files that are automatically included. And they sort of make a big deal and say, they say, oh, you can't write CG code anymore. You have to write HLSL. Whereas in earlier versions of Unity, apparently there was a difference if you used HLSL or CG or not. But as far as I can tell, HLSL and CG are the same thing. At least I've taken examples from textbooks that say they're using CG and typed them into Unity and made the appropriate tweaks just to make Unity happy. And they seem to work fine. I don't recall ever having to do anything where, oh, in HLSL, this is done differently. So here's what I need to change. Anyway, so all of the stuff outside of here is not actually part of HLSL per se. This is Unity specific, but any reasonably robust engine that you're using, whether it's something like Godot or even an in-house engine like the Frostbite engine. Now, don't work at Electronic Arts, so I don't know what's actually in the Frostbite engine, so I'm just guessing here, but I'll guess that they have something similar to this. Basically, this is all meta stuff that tells Unity how to organize the code you're about to give it. As I'll show you in a second, this will put it in your set of possible selectable shaders in a set of shaders called GPU 20. And within that folder, we'll find a solid color shader. Everything that we're going to look at now just has one sub shader and does one pass. Later, we'll look at situations where we have different shaders that do multiple passes. So include does exactly what you would expect. And the Unity docs, again, are a little confusing here because they'll say, oh, we call it unity cg dot cg inc because we want to maintain compatibility because that's the suffix people are used to but this is now really hlsl and i'm like unity come on it looks like hlsl and cg are the same to me but whatever pretty much any shader you write for unity you will want to include this set of definitions and what will admittedly make what I'm about to show you a little bit confusing if you either write your own engine or go to use somebody else's engine besides Unity is that there's a lot of variables that we're going to use that Unity will define for you and will, at the level of the Unity runtime, run various scripts that are internal to Unity that set these variables, like Unity underscore object to world, Unity underscore matrix VP. These do the sort of things that you expect. So Unity object to world is a four by four matrix that transforms coordinates from your artist space into the world space. Unity underscore matrix VP is a combination of the view transformation and the perspective transformation. And one thing that's a little bit confusing in Unity's nomenclature is it's sort of listing the order of the transformations if they're applied to, say, a vector. But this is not the actual order of the vertices, because if you'll notice here, we're using a column convention because the position that we're transforming is here on the right and we have our matrices on the left. So what Unity is actually doing is it's putting the view matrix here and the projection matrix here, and then it's pre-computing those P times V in the usual matrix algebra sense on the CPU side of Unity. 
So the fact that the V is in front here can be a little confusing, but that's just the convention Unity uses. Anyway, if you were not using Unity's rendering routines that fill in these variables for you and pass those into the GPU from the CPU side, you would have to actually put in your C Sharp script over on the Unity side. You would have to include the commands there in order to actually explicitly create these matrices on the CPU side and then send them into the GPU. Here, the Unity runtime is handling that for you behind the scenes. So what else is going on here? We have these pragmas that are designed to tell the compiler what's the vertex shader and what's the pixel shader. They use the word fragment for the pixel shader here. So we've got one called vertex solid color and fragment solid color. People will often just call this something like vert and call this frag. But because I'm showing a bunch of different examples, I like to have different names for these things for the different examples. That's not required. That's just what I'm doing here. So we have this C style syntax where we have inputs to a function and we have outputs. The semantic position, again, you can't just call this anything. You can't just make up semantic called Fred. No Fred. Apologies to anyone out there named Fred. Anyway, so position OS, that's been tagged as being a position. If you're writing your own engine, you would need to actually create the data structure that holds a whole bunch of positions representing vertices and that runs the API call for your GPU, Vulkan, OpenGL, DirectX, whatever, and sends that data over. Again, here, Unity is handling that for us. But just know that position OS is going to contain vertices. And there's an assumption that these are XYZ 3D positions, and then there's a W coordinate that holds the one in order to do the various transformations. But the way this particular code is set up, you don't necessarily have to put that one in the W component, and I'll show you why in a second. The output of the vertex shader that is processing a particular vertex, what is it output? Well, it's outputting a four-dimensional coordinate that represents a position on the screen in that final projected clip space. And so that's given the semantic SV underscore position. You could just take your position that's being thought of as a column and then multiply it by your object to world transformation matrix to get the position in world space. Notice we're using OS for object space, WS for world space, this is a convention that I saw in the new scriptable render pipeline code, so I decided to start using that kind of convention here, even though we're not actually using a scriptable render pipeline. Notice this line is commented out. Oh, I forgot to change the slashes here to have the gray in PowerPoint I'm using to represent comments, but whatever. Anyway, we're not actually doing that 4 by 4 multiply. What we're doing is we're actually taking that XYZ position we're sticking a one in here, and then we're doing the multiply. And you might say, well, why are we doing that? Is it because on the CPU side then we don't have to bother putting in that W equal one? Well, not really. This is actually a hint to the compiler. So our hope is that the compiler is gonna look at this, think about how it's implementing the matrix multiply. And when it needs to handle that one, Essentially, this is a hint to the compiler, and hopefully the compiler will use the fact that there's a one in that last column in order to simplify the code that's actually doing that matrix multiply. It's a little bit more confusing, but hopefully the compiler will generate some tighter code. This is one of the cases where making your code slightly less clear in order to try to hint potential optimizations to the compiler actually works. Usually, that's a fairly dubious kind of business. All right, so we've taken our vertex from the object space into the world space. And then the final thing we'll do is we'll do a final matrix multiply to go from the world space into the projected clip space. Now notice in here, there's no place where we're dividing by W to effectively divide by Z like you did in homework one. That's handled by other hardware on the card. And when I say that, I'm assuming there's a little bit of hardware handling that perspective division. But as far as we know, inside the chip, there could be some super advanced processor that was imported from 30 years in the future via time travel that's emulating all this in software, and that's fine. What we have with our shader model is just a definition of how the GPU responds to certain commands. And it's kind of up to the GPU how it wants to do it. 
But anyway, you as the programmer don't write that perspective divide. That's handled by another flag that's set in the API. So the positions that come out are used for different purposes. Eventually, there's that divide by Z, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately, this position is used to figure out the points of a triangle. And then a set of interpolation hardware is going to figure out what points on the screen are actually going to be a raster. All right, this isn't terribly <laughs> accurate in terms of what a natural rasterization would look like. Anyway, I just want to make the point that running that vertex shader is going to generate a whole bunch of pixels, more than just a pixel for each of the vertices. And then we could use that information to figure out the color. But here we're not. Here we're just going to return a floating point value consisting of the color green. And I'm using one here in alpha, so if there's any transparency action going on or whatever, this is going to show up. Anyway, so here we have the world's simplest pixel shader code. So here I'm running the simple shader scene, and I have four objects, each with a different shader on it. On the left, I have a shield, and I have the standard built-in Unity shader attached to it, defaulting to the most boring possible set of parameters. That's just for a general reference. Here I have the solid color shader that we just looked at, and it makes the object green. Okay, that isn't terribly interesting. Here's the scene view. We can also look at this in the game view. There you go. Now we're actually running the game. Now, if you're actually wondering what Unity's various matrices look like, I figured those out and I placed them here in the slides. Here's the orthographic matrix if you're using orthographic projection, and that's something that you can set in a script in Unity or your basic camera component in Unity will have a little parameter where you can set that. Anyway, you can either use an orthographic projection matrix or you could use a perspective projection matrix that I've listed here. And the reason I'm making a big deal about this is that if you look up the matrix 4x4 class in Unity's documentation, they never actually spell out what the matrix looks like. So I went through an iterative process where I took my best guess as to what the matrices look like. So when you run one of these scenes, besides seeing these cool looking spinny objects, there's also a matrix test object that's not actually a physical object in the scene. So it's at the traditional 0, 0, 0 where such objects are placed. And all it does is it runs this matrix test script. And what the matrix test script does is basically computes a bunch of stuff with this matrix 4x4 library and then multiplies them together, runs some built-in routines, and then computes my guess as to what those routines actually compute. And essentially what I wound up doing is adding and removing minus signs from various places and adding or removing various factors of two here and there or whatever until I got my guess of what was actually being computed to match with what Unity was actually giving me. And I had to do this because the Unity documentation does not say. There's nothing in the update. It's just running in the start routine of that component. And it outputs the results to this debug log in the console. So you can click on various matrices and then compare them and see what they look like. And that's what I did to figure out what the actual matrices were. In any case, you, the game programmer, writing a Unity game, very rarely needs to call this directly. Same thing with this perspective method or a bunch of other stuff that's built into the matrix 4x4 class. Usually these things are called for you by other things in Unity. Like the camera class, if needed, will call matrix 4 by 4 dot perspective and all the various other matrix generating things that you need for the vertex transformations. Sometimes you do need to call these if you're doing some special customized thing for some reason. So the vertex shader I just showed you used an approach where we had input parameters in the parentheses, and then we had an output parameter that we never really needed to name because it was whatever we returned. We could use an alternative style where we don't have a return command and this function isn't returning a particular result, but we do need to have some kind of output so we can actually name a variable, here we'll call it SV, and declare that variable out as an output variable for this function. So this is a programming language kind of function, not really a pure math kind of function. Anyway, we do need to remember to assign this variable to function. So this is just another style of programming. So now just to make sure this still works, I'm going to change this to the solid color out shader. And now it's red.
which is what I had. Okay, so that wasn't terribly exciting. So far, the pixel shaders I've showed you haven't taken any parameters. Here we're going to take in a color parameter, and all the pixel shader is going to do is just display whatever that color is. So the pixel shader still isn't doing anything fancy. And for that matter, most of what we're doing in the vertex shader isn't too fancy either. These are the vertex transformations that we've seen before. And now all I'm going to do is I'm going to take that position information and display it as an RGB color. So I'm going to put a one here in the alpha spot. And this is a little weird. You could think of this as doing something artistic, but the way I typically will use something like this is as a bit of a diagnostic to try to visualize what my geometry data is and to make sure it's being interpreted correctly. So here I'm taking a position that's X, a position that's Y, a position that's Z, and I'm interpreting X as red, Y as green, and Z as blue, which is completely illogical, and there's no particular reason I had to pick that particular ordering. This is just to visualize the position data. Now, notice that I'm not visualizing the transformed positions. That could also be interesting. But here I'm visualizing just the original object space positions. So any X, Y, or Z that is bigger than one, well, that's just going to wash out. That's going to hit max. And probably in object space, there's a bunch of negative coordinates, and those are going to just show up as black. But you could easily imagine multiplying this by some number and then adding or subtracting some number to be able to have a different look. Again, this isn't meant to be a logical thing. Again, this is just a way to look at numbers. So here I'm using this out convention because we're actually passing two things along. We're passing both the clip space position and this color. And based on what I've showed you so far, we would have to use this out convention because we have two things that we're returning and the return kind of syntax that we looked at only handles one parameter. In future lectures, we'll look at a way to set up structures that would let you do this with one parameter, but we'll get into that later. So for now, just remember we are computing this and it is being used to figure out what pixels need to be drawn. And I forgot to mention earlier, it's also using this to do Z-buffer calculations. If you have your Z-buffer stuff turned on so that objects that are closer than objects that are further away are the ones that you see. Now, something to constantly keep in mind is that this color is not directly passed in to this color. The colors that are being passed into the pixel shader are the interpolated colors where the hardware is interpolating between a fairly small number of colors being computed at the vertices. The fact that we have the color zero here matching the color zero here, those semantics hook to the interpolation hardware and that make that connection, but that's only because we're specifically using a piece of hardware designed to interpolate colors. Okay, so the third object from the left, or I should say the second object from the right, that has the vertex demonstration shader attached to it. So the X, Y, and Z are being interpreted as colors. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but it's kind of fun. One fun thing that Unity will let you do, which I'll mention here, is while the game's running, you can switch to the scene view. So you can see the game running from all sorts of different perspectives, which can be fun. Here's another example of doing some visualization. Now, the normal information we normally use to do something like a diffuse lighting calculation, and we'll do that a couple of lectures from now. But right now, suppose I just wanted to visualize the normal information. Normals go from minus one to one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the X and Y and Z of the normal, and I'm going to add one to each of those, which will make it map from zero to two. And now I'll divide by two. So things are now mapping from zero to one. Again, I'm putting one in the alpha component, and now we're going to compute this color for each of the vertices, interpolate those, and display those. Note that just like with the previous example, I'm showing the normals in object space. Doing coordinate space transformation of normal vectors is actually a little trickier than doing the transformations of vertex positions, so I'll show you how to do that in a couple of lectures. Anyway, this is just for visualization. So the object all the way on the far right here is running this normal visualization code. So this is often useful for different kinds of visualization 
And again, we can look at it here in the scene view and spin it around in different ways. So that's kind of fun.